Almighty God. And so the invitation is given to every person. It's an invitation that is given to us by Jesus Christ. It's an invitation that says, uh, come to me, follow me, be my disciple. And so we come to this place, we come to this time at the invitation of Jesus Christ. We come to accept his invitation to discipleship. As his disciples, we worship and we praise God in the midst of a world where uh, there is much cruelty. And in that world, we proclaim the God of compassion. In the midst of despair that threatens to swallow up whole lives and whole people, we proclaim a God of hope. In the midst of indifference and apathy, we proclaim a God of love. And so we gather. We gather to worship. We gather to worship together and to share our witness of God's living presence in this world. We pray together. Father, we come before you uh, this morning and we just want to declare that you are a faithful God. And so we gather with thanksgiving in our hearts, deeply grateful for the unfailing love and faithfulness that you've shown towards us, your people. When we call out to you, we know that you answer because you are faithful. When we are exhausted and you give us strength to go on, it's because of your faithfulness. When we find ourselves in trouble, your faithfulness means that you are there that, and standing beside us. And so we come before you in this moment with gratitude and praise. We have come to offer our worship the worship that is in our hearts and in our lives. We invite you to open our eyes to see and to know you here amongst us. Open our ears to recognize your voice and then send us from this place to live and to work in the world as your faithful disciples. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. There's another um, anniversary celebration and uh, they have uh, put a message into um, sponsoring the flowers. It's from uh, Debbie Rutting. Uh, Richard, you're my best friend, you're my soulmate, my greatest support, my strongest motivation, my heartbeat, my forever love. Uh, thank you for 50 years of marriage in all the ups and all the downs. Uh, God has blessed us abundantly. And she ends off with the words, love you, Stacks. Eh? <laughs> I want to share with you the scripture for today. Um, it's another one of my senior moments. It's the, I wish I could say it's the first of this year, but it's not. Um, I sent the wrong Bible passage through, but uh, hopefully we've corrected that. Um, it's the Covenant Service today. It's a service that uh, is uniquely Methodist, um, but it's a, a time when all Methodists uh, gather together and recommit themselves uh, to Christ. And saying that, uh, Lord, I offer you my Christ following for 2023. Uh, it is what it is uh, in its very best and very worst. Uh, but I want to commit to a greater following of you, a better following of you, in 2024. And so today we commit ourselves to that, to be the best possible disciples of Christ that we can be, for the sake and for the benefit of this our wonderful community and country and world. And so that's what we're up to today. And uh, for that, I want to uh, share with you uh, the passage that has been set uh, for this Sunday. It's Mark chapter 1, uh, just reading verse 16 to 20. And it's all about discipleship. It's about our offer and the offer of those that have gone before us uh, to become the disciples of Christ. 
reading from verse 16. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon, he saw his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake. Uh, they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out into this world to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw some more fishermen. He saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat. They were preparing their nets. And without delay he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and they followed Jesus. The Lord will always bless the hearing of his word. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Well, the Bible reading um, was there, and um, it is a very, very uh, simple but profound um, couple of words. It's an incident that repeats itself in history. It's something of the work of God uh, over time. It's something that God is always up to. And so we can expect something of what happened in this passage to happen over and over and over again. We can expect something of this passage to spill over into our own lives as we experience in a new way God's loving initiative that is operative in you and in me. It's this moment of being called, being called by God. And so Jesus calls Andrew and Peter and James and John. He calls them to send them out into this world to become fishers of people. Now, as the journey of the disciples of Jesus unfolds in the Gospels, and we can just limit ourselves to the Gospel of Mark in which we are reading, um, we will know that there is this wonderful appeal about following Jesus that draws people into discipleship. In the text that we read, I hope you sense some of the appeal. Following Jesus was so appealing that these four fishermen left life as they knew it. And we mustn't underestimate the, the gravity of that moment. They left everything familiar. They left the way that they were working and gaining an income. They left stuff behind so that they could respond to this call to follow Jesus. It happens to Matthew a little later in the Gospel. He is making a huge amount of money as a tax collector. And Jesus says, come and follow me. And he's lost income from tax collecting. Happens in that moment. There's an appeal when Jesus says, follow me. And as a result of that appeal, in those kind of instances, when we hear the call of God, there's an immediate, there's an unquestioned following of Jesus. And here we see it. They follow Jesus as a rabbi. They follow him as a teacher to hear and to watch the good news of the kingdom of God being preached. They follow Jesus to watch the establishment of the kingdom of God. They follow Jesus to watch the things of heaven become real right here on earth. They follow Jesus so that they can see the demonstrated activity and power of God happening in their midst.
And so when Jesus calls people to follow him, there's something desirable in that call. I wonder if you have any kind of affinity to that. Huh? A desirability when you hear the call of Jesus to come and to be my disciple. Can you remember that spontaneous, that I don't need to think too much, I'm there. I'm following. I want you to be my rabbi. And it's not without reason, especially when we consider what that decision allows us or affords us. Considering that we are saved from evil and sin, from the chaos and the disappointment and the failures of this world. Saved from those. We open to new possibilities. Life is different going forward. Considering that we experience the relief of being atoned to, atoned to God our Father, because in this wonderful, wonderful way, the power of God works in us and releases us from the things that hold us and make us guilty, convict us of the poverty of our own beings. Huh? Those lesser moments that cause a little bit of shame in our lives. And there's this wonderful offer of a power that can address that. And you can be freed of that. Considering that when we respond to the call of Christ, we're responding to restoration and wholeness. We're responding to a life that is holy, that is good, that is wholesome, that is together, that is not inconsistent. Responding to a life that brings joy beyond all human understanding and a peace that surpasses the peace that is in this world. The gift of getting things right living heaven while we are on earth is something desirable in that call to follow Christ. However, there's a part of following Jesus that, is not so easy, that we're not so easily drawn to. I could say that there is an element in following Christ that is unappealing or unattractive. That part of our following of Jesus is sometimes met with a bit of reluctance. Uh, Jesus, yes, but you want me to be part of your family. Have you checked your family out? Mm hmm, not so sure. An odd bunch. Jesus, yes, your family, we'll see how it goes. A huh? bit of reluctance. Or there might even be a bit of resistance. Jesus, I need to let you know that uh, you only lived in this world for 33 years. I'm a bit older than that. And so there's stuff that I know that you don't know. I'm going to be reluctant to take your advice on this one. Or some kind of objection. Jesus, you know that when I was called into ministry, when I was called to follow you, I think you misled me. You didn't tell me what it lay ahead. And I don't think I signed up for this. I want to reassess my call. I object to my call taking me to where I am. I wonder if those have been something of your experience at some stage in your own walk with Christ. I think that there are parts of our life that simply refuse to accept the discipleship road. I think that in 2023, uh, there are moments in your life, in my life, where we have done exactly that. Your discipleship road is just unattractive, Jesus. I'm not having it. I will find another way. 
that they're pockets of resistance that simply refuse the Lordship of Jesus in our living. And so while in the Gospel we read that Jesus' call of his disciples uh, are responded to, in this case, with an immediate response. If we just hold on a little bit, if we just carry on reading, we realize that this, there is more to follow onto this initial response. And as the Gospels unfold, we will discover that even in the lives of the discipleship is this element of Jesus, your discipleship is unattractive. No, thank you. There's this moment of non-discipleship. And so although we read in this text that Peter immediately accepts the task and follows Jesus, and while Peter does rend family ties and forsakes a certain amount of wealth and turns his back on his regular income, his discipleship later shows itself to be motivated more by selfish incentive, more by personal gain, than by sacrificial following. He thinks he's made a good decision, a pro-Peter decision, a decision that will benefit him in the long run. That's why he makes it. And so he follows Jesus, but he does so without repenting, without turning a all of his life around without letting go of certain things that need to be let go of, without putting an end to or having personal gain being disengaged. I'm doing it for myself, not for you, Jesus. Huh? I'll follow you for me. Bit of a contradiction there. And so in some twisted way, we see Peter following Jesus under the inspiration of personal gain. For Peter, if Jesus is the Messiah, if Jesus is the one that has been spoken of, well then surely one will only benefit from association with him. And so Peter expected that by following Jesus, having left everything behind for God, Jesus would establish God's rule in Israel. Jesus would bring in a new age where they were free of Roman occupation and oppression. And when that happened, well then it is my time to shine. That's my moment of prosperity and status and power coming all my way. And it's for that reason that Jesus has to address the areas of discipleship that the disciples reject and find unattractive. And so we hear Jesus telling the disciples, whoever of you wants to be my disciple, you must deny yourself. You must take up your cross and you must follow me. The following will not happen while you haven't denied self. The following will not happen if you haven't taken up your cross. And if you take up your cross, where are you heading to? You're heading to your death. Very little attractive about that. But if you don't, you cannot follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me will, and for the gospel will save it. At another time, Jesus is found telling his disciples that many of you who are first will discover that in fact you are lost. And you will discover that the lost are first. On another occasion, Jesus teaches saying, whoever wants to become great amongst you, if you are looking for this moment of glory, when everything is revealed. Well, then you're going to have to learn to become the servant of others. And if you want to be first, you're going to have to learn to be the slave of all. And so as we read the Gospel of Mark, and as we read, his initial response is 
very, very positive. Peter, we find, is unable to renounce self and take up his cross. And so, on so many occasions in his life, he reverses the role of the disciple-rabbi relationship. He denies the call to follow Jesus. He turns it around. Jesus, follow me. I'll take you places. And so there's record of Peter searching for Jesus after massive ministry, massive uh, moments of display where Christ is active and powerful in this world. And then Jesus disappears and he can't find him. Jesus, where are you? Let's get back to Capernaum so that we can continue where we left off. And Jesus says, my ministry is beyond Capernaum. We move in. Follow me. You don't need to tell me how to minister. We find a moment where Peter rebukes Jesus for refusing to believe Jesus after saying that he is the suffering servant. And so there's strong words spoken to you because Peter doesn't want to follow a suffering servant. We find at the transfiguration, we find Peter suggesting that Jesus should stay on this mountain. Let's build tents. Let's make this permanent. Let's stay up here because he has good. And Jesus says, this is not the mountain where my work will be accomplished. I need to go down to Jerusalem and be raised on another mountain for my work to be done. We see at Jesus' arrest, uh, Peter takes uh, things into his own hands. Let them try and arrest you. And I'm telling you, I'm going to start swinging this sword and there's going to be trouble. And he's corrected by Jesus. You can go and read that in chapter 14, verse 47. Now my sense is that what Jesus needed to teach Peter, he also needs to teach you and me. Unless we're better than Peter. You and I need to hear the parts of discipleship and we need to hear Jesus speaking and inviting us into those parts of discipleship that we find undesirable and unattractive. We need to be challenged today by the cost of discipleship. And so I want to share with you a wonderful teaching by a theologian named Walter Brueggemann. And he says there are four trade-ins, there are four things that we need to leave behind in order to follow Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to share those with you in the hopes that you can just orientate yourself a little better in this world, in 2024, as a better follower of Christ. All right. And so he uh, speaks of these four. The first one, he says that the first trade is the trade of a self-determining narrative of our own culture. That's what we need to trade in. We let go of it a self-determining narrative of our culture. As followers of Christ, we give up or we repent of self-determined teachings because the truth about those things. And it could be our own teachings, it could be just philosophies, ideologies, uh, political campaigns, uh, and the words that are found in them but we give them up. We trade them in because they are self-determining narratives of our culture and we follow Christ because what we think and what others think, what we think, even if we think it's the most important thing, even if we think that it is best for us, it constitutes a very, very limited perspective. 
And that trading is so difficult. I know that I am not to hold grudges against people. But I think that I've got the whole story behind this person. And there's a, legit there's a legitimacy to me holding a grudge. And there's godly purpose in this person being received begrudgingly by me. How much do I really know about that person? Can I give that up as a self-determining narrative of this culture and say God knows more of this person than I know? And he has told me to find a space in this world where I live without grudges. Are you ready to trade that in? Or if you're not, when are you ready to trade it in? How long do, does another have to live in your begrudging presence? And who determines that length? That's part of the self-determining narrative of our culture. This person deserves seven years. I'll give it to them. And so we trade that in for the narrative of the gospel. And we trade that in for the narrative of the gospel by seeking the advice of those who have gone before us, those who are on the discipleship road, those who can speak to us a word of God. That's why we gather for worship. That's why we surround ourselves with people who can speak into our lives. That's why we read scripture, so that we are exposed to people who know something about the gospel narrative. And we open ourselves up to the promptings of God's Holy Spirit. And I'm doing this because I believe that this is God, what God wants me to do. Not because it makes sense, not because it will fit well with a certain ideology that I ascribe to, not because it ties in nicely with my political affiliations. Because this is what God wants me to do. I will live a life defined or under the narrative of God and God alone. And so the narrative of the gospel is not just about human effort and about being led, uh, uh, about um, personal effort, but it's about surrendering your life and being led by those who have gone before us into a discipleship of Christ. Brueggemann continues. He says if you are able to do that, well, you're 25% of the way. Um, but there's a second trade-off that's needed. And so you need to move into obedience that is characterized by the narrative of the gospel. And that obedience is simply to respond to what God asks us to do. It asks us to be open to change. It asks us to adopt new priorities. Sometimes it will ask us to radically reorientate our whole life's direction. Sometimes it means a total change. And so obedience is not simply a matter of receiving the new, but it is also a matter of figuring out what of the old I need to let go of. When we know these things, we will find God growing within us. And those who observe you and those who observe me should say that there goes somebody who resembles Jesus in the way that they think and reason. There resembles Jesus. Have you listened to them? Those words, they're different. We resemble Jesus in the way we act you know what, this person receives me differently. There's an ease and a comfort in this person's presence. 
We resemble Jesus in the way that we live in this society. We don't follow the trends. And we don't ascribe to the practices and the policies of this culture without engaging and saying, is this what God wants me to do? There's an obedience that is required. And so we trade our lives in to come under the obedience of Christ. And it will be then that you and I will be disciples of Christ. Brueggemann says that thirdly, we will be required to open ourselves to the narrative of the gospel. And part of that will mean that we were are no longer ignorant of the power and the possibility of God bringing about change where change seems impossible. Open yourself up to the possibility of the gospel. And so this trauma that you went through that defines your life forever after, it doesn't need to. It's taken a power that it doesn't actually have. There is a power and a possibility for your trauma through Christ. And this disappointment and this moment of unlove, and this, there is possibility through the power of Jesus Christ. And what you think is impossible is not impossible. I have seen children been witness to children who have been neglected and abused by their own parents honoring them, honoring them at their death or in times of need. And I think, how do they do it? I wonder if I'd be as gracious, but I've seen it done. Because they are thinking of the power and the possibility that is afforded to them through Jesus Christ. And so at times when life seems the most absolute, God can step in and transform the disastrous into the creative. And opportunity and growth and goodness can emerge from your darkest day. It's God's nature to transform despair into hope. It's God's nature to remold and to reshape and to bring change throughout his creation. And we are partners in that transformation just as God has made us partners in creation. And so we are not only looking after, but we are recreating something with Christ every day. Our call is to be faithful and obedient and loving. God will call us to change our ways. He'll call us to work with him. He'll call us into a harmony with one another to witness and be witnesses of the transforming power of the love of God that can redeem everything, anyone, anywhere that can create and sustain us daily. And so when we reorientate our lives around these truths, well then we can say that we are under the discipleship of Christ because I'm open to what Christ is going to do in this moment that is in front of me. And then lastly, when we are an example of the redemptive love that is shown on the cross, when we are an example of the grace and the inclusion that is evident in the fellowship of the early church, when we are an example of people who serve rather than wanting to be served, well, then we know that we have become like Christ. We have followed him to the end. We've been shaped by a different narrative, the narrative of the gospel. And so that's the reflection on God's word today. 
And I really just want to end off by suggesting some areas of living that might need to be surrendered uh, to God today in order to make 2024 a stronger, more real, truer discipleship journey for you and for me. And so as I suggest these areas, I would want you just to capture one sentence that expresses a reality in your living uh, that will help you on your discipleship journey. And maybe you would need to start it off with Jesus today. I surrender. And you finish the sentence. Huh? Maybe that's what we can do today. And then I'm going to invite you uh, and your response. And it's a response to the narrative of the gospel. It might feel unattractive, but I'm going to invite you to bring that sentence up and to surrender it uh, in the covenant prayer. Surrender it in the moment of communion. Say it, speak it, offer it to Christ. And so maybe that surrender lies in the realm of trading in what you think is most important and what you think is best. Are you ready to trade that in? To seek the advice of those who have walked this road before you and to seek the promptings of God's Spirit for your way forward. Maybe the surrender is Jesus calling you to either stop doing what you're currently doing because it's just fruitless. It's lifeless. It's not doing any good. There's no godly purpose to that act. Can you stop doing what you're currently doing? Or maybe you need to start doing what you're not doing. Is there something that will lead to a greater discipleship where you to do it? I shared previously that when I was confirmed, the minister gave me a Bible and said, read it. Something I can do. It's made the discipleship journey different. Maybe the surrender is in trading just to trade in the fatalism and the realism of this world. People who speak in absolutes, oh, in your situation there's no hope. Hey? Uh, here are the odds. Uh, it's a scientific fact that. And being an academic and being someone who's dealt with scientific fact, a scientific fact is based on probability. They run tests. And in 98% of those tests, this is what happened. Therefore, we can establish that, and the scientific fact is made. But what about the 2% that wasn't uh, part of the fact? It's as real as the 98 Can we trade in fatalism and realism and receive the power and possibility of God that brings about change even when we are told that change is not possible? Maybe the surrender is to a redemptive living. A redemptive life that offers grace to somebody in your world. A redemptive life that includes somebody that is excluded in your world. Just give somebody who is different to you or even opposed to you a gap. It's an act of, of surrender. Would you be able to Surrender yourself in the service of others in a particular way in 2024.
what will lead to a greater surrender, a truer discipleship for you and for me. May you and I be led into a purer discipleship by following Jesus. Following Him not when it is just desirable to follow Him, but even in those times when it is tough and difficult and unattractive to do so. And so may God bless us on this Covenant Sunday. Amen. And so the remainder of our time is simply to respond uh, to the word of God that we have heard today. We do so by making covenant with him and we do so through communion. And so I'm going to lead you in a bit of a reflection before you join in with me in saying the covenant prayer. You will know that God made covenant with the people of Israel, uh, calling them to be a holy nation. They were chosen to bear witness to God's steadfast love by finding delight in obedience. And the covenant was renewed in Jesus Christ our Lord in his life, in his work, in his death, in his resurrection. In him all people may be set free from sin and its power. In him all may be united in love and in obedience. In this covenant God promises us new life in Christ. For our part, we are to promise to live no longer for ourselves, but for God. And so we meet at this time, therefore, as generations have met before us, to renew the covenant which bound them and binds us to God. And so we're going to take a moment just to come clean with God as we seek forgiveness in those places we, we have denied God's claim upon us. And so God of mercy, will you hear us as we confess our sins for the sin that has made us slow to learn of you and your ways, for the sin that has been, made us reluctant to follow Christ, for the sin that has been afraid to bear the cross. Father, for these sins we need your mercy and, for, and your forgiveness. For the sin that has caused a poverty in our worship, for a sin that leads us to respond to you in formality and in selfishness. Father, for neglecting our fellowship, for not entering into the means of grace sufficiently, for our hesitating and reluctant witness for Christ. We stand before you in need of forgiveness and in need of your mercy. For the sin that leads us to take the things that you have gifted us with and use them for our own purposes, that in our giftedness we somehow choose to evade our responsibilities we fail to be good stewards of your creation. Father, in these moments we stand in need of your forgiveness and in need of your mercy. For the sin that has made us unwilling to overcome evil with good, for that sin which causes us to be tolerant of injustice, for that sin that causes us to be quick to condemn, for that sin which causes us to be selfish in our sharing of your love with others. Father, we are in need of your forgiveness and your mercy. And so, Father, in your constant love and the fullness of your mercy, we ask that you will blot out our offenses, that you will wash away our guilt, that you will cleanse us from all sin. Father God, create in us a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within us. Give us the joy of your help again. Strengthen us with a willing spirit. And we know, Father, that if we confess our sins, we know that you are faithful and just and you will forgive our sins. And you will cleanse us and purify us and give us new hearts for a life of righteousness. 
And so in our time of confession and repentance, we know that all who truly repent, you speak your gracious word and say, your sins are forgiven. Amen. And so, brothers and sisters in Christ, let us again accept our place within God's covenant, which God has made with us and with all who are called to be Christ's disciples. This means that by the help of the Holy Spirit, we will accept God's purpose for us. We will accept the call to love and to serve God in all our work and in all our life. And so Christ has many services that are required from us. And some are easy and others are really difficult. Some will bring honor, others will bring reproach. Some are suitable to our natural inclinations and our material interests. Some will be contrary to both. In some we may please Christ and please ourselves. In others we will not be able to please Christ except by denying ourselves. And yet the power to do all these things is given to us in Jesus Christ, who is able and who is powerful enough to strengthen us. And so let us make this covenant of God our own. Let's give ourselves to God, trusting in his promises, relying on his grace. Eternal God, in your faithful and enduring love, you call us to share in your gracious covenant with Jesus Christ. In obedience we hear and we accept your commands. In love we seek to do your perfect will. The joy, that we offer us, uh, the joy we offer ourselves anew to you. We declare the covenant prayer with you today. And so we join in and say, I am no longer my own, but yours. Your will, not mine, be done in all things. Wherever you place me, in all that I do, in all that I may endure, when there is work for me and when there is none, when I'm troubled and when I'm at peace, your will be done. When I'm valued and when I'm disregarded, when I find fulfillment and when it's lacking, when I have all things and when I have nothing, I willingly offer all I have and am to serve you, Glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine, I am yours. May it be so forever. Let this covenant be fulfilled in heaven. Amen. Amen. the Lord mighty God bless and keep you forever give you peace perfect peace strength for every endeavor lift your Yeah.